Good morning, everyone. We're about to start. My name is Mayro Salvador, and I am the Executive Director of Pueblo Science. On behalf of the Pueblo Science team, I am pleased to welcome you all to the Hackathon for Science Education. Before we begin, we wish to acknowledge this land in which Pueblo Science operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from the, across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work with this land. It is really nice to see so many students who are interested in helping us make this world a better place. This event is fully booked. This is the second year that Pueblo Science is hosting this event. Pueblo Science, as, as some of you hopefully know, is a Canadian charity with a mission to reduce poverty by advancing science education and enabling innovation in low resource communities. We train local science teachers to incorporate hands-on STEM activities that foster scientific thinking and creative problem solving using low cost and locally available materials. We also enable local change makers to shape their community by providing hands-on collaborative workshops. Since our founding in 2010, we have trained over 3,500 teachers and impacted over 400,000 students. And our programs have been delivered in seven countries, including Canada, Guyana, Jamaica, Philippines, Thailand, India, and Bolivia. To give a scope to these hackathons, hackathons projects today, we will use the Philippines as a test ground. And designing for low resource communities like the Philippines can be challenging because of limitations that we are not familiar with here in Canada. So before we reveal that top secret challenge, let me give you a brief introduction of the Philippines. The Philippines is consisting of 7,648 islands and rumor has it that on, on low tide, it becomes 7,650. It is located along the typhoon belt in the Pacific. So it get, there's 20 typhoons every year that visits about, that's the average. It, that get that visits the Philippines. And uh, while I was growing up, I grew up there in Northern Philippines. We get visited by at least one typhoon every week from June to September. This causes flooding, destroys property and agricultural produce and disrupt, disrupts learning in school. I remember my father having to rebuild the roofing of our house every year because it was taken by a strong typhoon. Food becomes very scarce after a typhoon because all the fruit trees and the vegetables are destroyed. As a kid though, oblivious to all these problems, we were happy that classes are often suspended. The Philippines is also situated in the Pacific Ring of Fire. It is vulnerable, vulnerable to frequent earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. It is very common to wake up in the middle of the night and you would experience an earthquake, the strongest of which was 6.8 while I was and the Richter scale while I was growing up. It is very densely populated. You see only over 2000 of those islands are inhabited and we have about 107 million population. In Manila, the capital, there's 71,263 people per square kilometer. The residential areas are not really in tall buildings. So you can imagine how um, limited the household spaces are. 
16.6% of the population live below the poverty line. The minimum, minimum wage is about $7 per day. The biggest contributor to the GDP of the Philippines is the service sector. That includes business process outsourcing, tourism, and overseas remittance. There are a lot of Filipinos scattered around the world, about 25% of the population. We are a very social, so we like groups, so we like to connect to each other and are very family oriented. So many people send money to their relatives to help the economy as well. The second lar largest GDP contributor is the industry. That includes mining and mineral processing, shipbuilding, electronics, and semiconductor. The third major export of the Philippines is gold, followed by iron ore. It is also very agricultural, producing coconut, bananas, rice, sugarcane, mangoes, pineapples. There is an indigenous community in the south in a city called Davao, in a, in a province called Davao that we visited once to deliver a children's uh, camp. We asked the village chief to send the kids, but on that day of the camp, all the kids and the women from newborn to 60 plus years old showed up and attended the camp. They were so excited to meet and learn from us. We had to hike to their village for two hours from the main road along a muddy, narrow, and winding road. Their village was surrounded by lots of bananas and other fruit trees, and we were told that bringing these products to the market was quite hard because they had to carry a lot of those things on their back, and so food spoilage is a common problem. Transportation is congested. In 2019, while I was in Manila, a five kilometer trip can take three hours. And you may think you can walk faster, but no one would dare walk in the highways. And it's also very, very hot. Even though sunlight is abundant and there are some geothermal and wind power potential, there is an energy crisis in the country. Three times a day, you would experience a power outage, and that is if you're lucky. One out of three Filipinos has access to internet, but very unreliable and very expensive. The educational system is both private and public. The private schools are mostly for the rich due to the cost, and the public schools are free, but have very for poor facilities or sometimes none. Educational supplies and equipment are also lacking. In the remote areas, there are no classrooms and books. Teachers are under-trained, but they appreciate training. We had teachers traveling four hours by boat and eight hours by land just to get to our training. You see, there are a lot of problems in the Philippines. 40% of the population are youth. So we are hoping that by engaging the youth in STEM, they will be able to start thinking about the solutions to their community problems and stop the cycle of poverty. That is why we are here together today to develop activities for youth and teachers in the Philippines and make STEM learning fun and relevant for the, for the youth and the teachers. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our fantastic volunteer organizers. You will probably meet a lot of them later on, led by Angie Zhang. And we also thank our sponsors, Manulife, MBNA, and TD Insurance. Thank you all for being here. I wish you every success, and I look forward to hearing your projects. Now, 
I would like to turn you over to Angie Zhang. Angie is a second year chemistry student. Last year, she joined us as a volunteer and she said she, would, she really enjoyed the event and she decided to lead, to lead this event this year. She had done an amazing job putting this event together with the help of the other volunteers. Angie. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Maros, for that wonderful introduction. Um, my name is Angie, and I will be presenting to you um, your challenge details and more details about, in general, how the event will go. Um, so first, before we really get into challenge criteria, I just want to outline all the platforms we are using. I know there are quite a number of them, so hopefully it doesn't get too confusing. Obviously, we are using Twitch right now, but we will only be using Twitch for the opening and closing ceremonies. And this is just because we want to reduce um, any lag that might happen from having too many people on a Zoom call at once. But after this opening ceremony, all our subsequent uh, workshops, our judging sessions, pitches, activities will all be held by Zoom when they are live. Um, and uh, we are also using Google Drive. You guys should all already have access to the Google Drive folder. And this is where important documents such as the schedule, reimbursement form, and the participant guidelines will be posted. Uh, Discord is the main server we'll be using for our hackathon. So this is where you should ask any questions. This is where we'll be keeping you updated with announcements. And this is where we might reach out to your team leads to check in with them. And this most importantly is where our mentor program will be facilitated. And I'll talk more about that later. Lastly, we are using DevPost as a submission platform. So DevPost is where your final project will be uploaded, but it's also where you can post updates with your team. So this can be like blog posts, like updates and photos and stay tuned about this, but um, the most active team will be receiving a prize. So make sure you um, make a DevPost project page soon so you can start doing that. Um, and this is just a quick reminder, if you haven't done this yet, make sure you have already signed the participation agreement form. Uh, this morning, Saskia also sent out a sign-in sheet. So everybody, each individual participant must sign this sheet. And you have to do this before 10.30 a.m. to receive a full refund of your $20 deposit. Um, so make sure you get this done soon. And team leads, please make sure all of your members have completed this as well. Part of this sign-in sheet requires you to input your Discord username and your DevPost username. Um, so make sure you do that. Uh, I recommend downloading a Discord app before you begin. Um, you can use it through browser, but the app is much better and easier to work with. Um, and also you can submit a team name as part of the sign-in sheet. There have been a couple really good ones already, but if you don't wanna pick a name, you can stick to the number that we have assigned you. And finally, the slide you guys have been waiting for, this is the reveal of our challenge. Um, more details uh, about this can be found in a document called Guidelines for Participants in the Google, Google Drive. Um, so you don't have to take screenshots of these slides or anything. Um, everything you need is in that document. So make, make sure you read that over. Um, but your challenge throughout the hackathon is to create a, a sustainability themed science activity kit for high school students in the Philippines. And this kit should teach and link to one or more science or engineering concept in the Philippine science curriculum. In the curriculum, these concepts or learning goals are referred to as learning competencies. The curriculum will be uploaded in the Google Drive. So make sure you check on that and make sure your project goals adhere to those learning competencies that are listed. Um, your project should also clearly teach how this science or engineering concept you're demonstrating can be connected to one or more United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs, and more specifically how it is related and connected to, to the Philippines and the challenges they face there. Um, so the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, were adopted by the United Nations in 2015 as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure everyone enjoys peace and prosperity. Um, there are 17 of these goals in total, so make sure to read up on them. Some of them include clean water and sanitation, zero hunger, and affordable and clean energy. Um, so do make sure you take a look at those goals. 
And then uh, this point over here, um, your challenge should inspire local innovation. So what does that mean? Um, your project should lead students to consider what they can do locally to alleviate challenges and enhance the sustainability of their community. Um, James will be talking after me uh, and he will be showing some examples of Pueblo science kits that do that. And one of our workshop leaders, Akeen, will also be showing some examples of work that has really inspired local community members to take action and um, be creatively address the challenges that they face. And ultimately this is what leads to sustainable change in a community. Um, also, your project must be capable of being taught in um, two to three 90 minute instructional periods. The less prep work that is required, the better. Um, and your project should be a physical device. This is up to you to figure out. Obviously, it's a little bit harder to coordinate now, but again, uh, we are teaching STEM concepts and hands-on learning is very valuable in this case. Um, and you will be given up to $50 of budget money that we will reimburse you with, um, but your project, your final project in total should only cost a max of $20 if it is reusable and $5 if it is a single use kit. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about reimbursement, but make sure you don't start spending money until after your first project proposals. In case you have to make any dramatic changes in your project direction, you don't wanna have used already half of your budget. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to stress the importance of hands-on learning and developing a project that is interactive. The idea here is that, you know, the hands-on component of STEM that most of us have had the opportunity to experience and fall in love with shouldn't be sacrificed due to limited resources. So um, again, that's where the creativity part of this hackathon really comes in, where it's up to you to make sure that this hands-on component isn't lost just because of the limited availability of resources in these communities. And like I mentioned a little bit, you will be reimbursed up to 50 Canadian dollars for any um, items you might need for your project. Um, but again, make sure you don't start spending money right away. I would wait until your first project proposal is over. Um, that way you don't spend your money on a project that maybe you have to discard. Um, and for reimbursement, you have to fill out a reimbursement form. Each team should only be submitting one and this form will be available to you in the Google Drive. And this is just an outline of everything you should be submitting or presenting um, throughout the week. So the first task that is the most eminent right now is your first project proposal. And these project proposals will take place um, tonight from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, one person from your team should sign up on the Doodle form to pick a time at which this um, presentation can occur. And this just involves giving a five minute project pitch just showing what your project is. And the purpose of this proposal is mainly to get our feedback um, on whether or not your project idea is viable and accessible um, just in the context of our challenge and of the Philippines communities that we are addressing. Um, and again, some teams might need to do a second project proposal, but um, sign up for this proposal and the format of this proposal will be the same as the first. The second project proposals will occur tomorrow. And then part of your final submission, um, you have to write a science activity teacher's manual. Uh, a template for what this manual will look like will be available in the Google Drive folder. And this must be written and submitted through DevPost on the final day of the event. So Sunday, the 27th at 10 a.m. Um, along with this, you must also submit a project video, which can be a maximum of two minutes in length. And this also goes on the DevPost by Sunday at 10 a.m. Um, and then lastly, you will be doing a live demonstration with a final pitch, um, also five minutes long, which will be on Zoom in front of our judges panel. And um, this is where your scoring and um, determination of the winners will be made. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about prizes, but they will be based on all of the final components of your project. Um, and just another quick note on your pitches. Like I said, all pitches should be five minutes long, but your first and second pitches are really um, serve the purpose of getting you feedback on your project idea and making sure it is good to go. Um, your final pitch is really what contributes to um, your scoring and which teams are selected as prize winners. Um, make sure you sign up for your first and second project proposal pitch times uh, using the doodle form that will be made available to you. It is currently on the Discord already. Um, if needed, you have to do the same 
same for your second proposal, but the schedule for the final presentations and your project demonstrations uh, in front of the judges panel, uh, that schedule will be randomized and we will post it closer to the date. And for all pitches, please make sure all of your team members arrive on the Zoom call two minutes before your presentation time. We will let you out of the waiting room when it is your time to begin, but this is just to make sure we all keep on track. And I have the honor of introducing who our pitch judges will be this year. Um, first, Dr. Alice Herrera is a sustainable energy management professional with over 30 years of experience in sustainable energy and conservation demand management. In particular, she was the president of the Energy Efficiency Practitioners Association of the Philippines and was the head of the Fuels and Energy Division of the Industrial Technology Development Institute in Manila. Um, next, I want to introduce Dr. Ruby Sulan, who is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Physical and Environmental Sciences and the Department of Chemistry. Her research is on mechanomicrobiology and materials biosystems interactions. I think some of you might know what that means. Um, and our third judge featured here is Izzy Calder, who is a partner, lawyer, and patent agent with Bearskin and Parr here in Toronto. She's a co-leader of the firm's artificial intelligence practice group and helps technology clients build patent portfolios for a wide variety of electrical, computer, and mechanical related inventions. She's a frequent speaker and supporter of the Toronto technology community, working with institutions like the Entrepreneurship Hatchery and the Impact Center at U of T. And uh, we might be announcing a fourth judge closer to the event. If we do, you will hear more news about that person. And here is just an outline of the criteria um, based on which your final pitch will be judged. Um, I obviously didn't include details here. Everything that you need to know will be in the guidelines for participants. Um, so make sure you read that in depth so you know that you know what our judges are looking for. But mainly um, make sure your materials are accessible and available to communities in the Philippines. Make sure the procedure for your activity is clear and not too convoluted. Obviously, you'll be judged on creativity, enjoyability, and also if your project fits with our sustainability theme and pertains to the Philippines. Um, so make sure you look over all of the criteria for the judging. Um, your teacher's manual obviously will also be judged and it will be judged by our Pueblo Science team. So um, uh, those are those people are listed below. You've already met May Rose and um, James will be speaking after me, but also Alon and Leo will be presenting as, oh, will be um, judging those manuals as well. Our Pueblo Science team is consisted of um, you know, of STEM professionals with um, a lot of experience with STEM education and all of them have gone to communities in the Philippines and other places around the world and worked with teachers, schools and students in low resource communities. So they really know what, um, you, what to look for and uh, make sure you read the judging criteria for all of these sessions to make sure that your group adheres to those criteria. Um, so um, this is just featuring our prize pool. We have $900 for the top teams. Likely this means three $300 prizes, but this will depend on how the scoring um, ends up. And um, again, your, uh, the prizes for um, the teams that are selected for that um, first prize um, are determined based on your final project demonstration in front of our judges panel, panel and based on your um, activity manual. We also have a $500 prize before the People's Choice Award, and this will be selected based on the DevPost public voting. So make sure your um, video is really up to par. There will be a workshop speaker, Grace Ling. Um, I'll mention her again later on, but she will be giving a workshop on how to make um, a good video for presentations such as this. Um, one thing, um, DevPost is uh, a hackathon submission platform and most of what the hackathons on DevPost are software based so they might ask you some additional questions as part of your submission but um, we won't be marking that um, but it will be made public so make sure you like what's on there and what's featured. And I just wanted to give a quick run through of all the workshops that we'll be offering. Um, they're all geared to be very useful to you and your team and very project specific. So um, make sure as many members of your team as possible can attend all of these. Um, first coming up today, very soon at 11, um, Jordan will be giving a workshop that will help you with ideation specifically in relation to the SDGs. Um, Jordan launches 20 to 30 innovative tech startups every year as the Waterloo director of the Founder Institute 
Institute, the world's largest pre-seed accelerator headquartered in Silicon Valley. So his workshop will be on creating a project idea, especially one with a focus on the UN SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and developing businesses and projects around them. Um, also today, Leo will be giving a presentation at 1.30, and here he will give you the details for exactly what you should be including in your project proposal, so this will be really important as well. Um, Leo is a member of the Pueblo Science Board of Directors and has traveled for teacher training and outreach programs in India, the Philippines, and Guyana. He has spent much of his career bringing science to society as an entrepreneur, a coordinator for an innovation center, and an entrepreneurship educator. So again, his workshop will be on developing a project proposal. So will be very important for your first and second pitches. Um, tomorrow, Kayla Lambie, uh, who is a teacher and curriculum developer at Hatch Coding, will be presenting as well. Her workshop's topic will be teaching computational thinking in a STEM PBL environment and will help provide you with a different method of critical thinking, analysis, and tackling challenges such as this one. Also tomorrow, I mentioned this earlier, but Grace Ling will be giving a workshop as well. Grace Ling is a UX design intern at Electronic Arts, the founder and design lead of Design Buddies and an admin at intern.club. She will be giving a workshop on how to effectively create a presentation and design a video. This workshop will be very helpful for creating your final two minute video submission. And last but not least, um, Zaheen will be presenting also next Saturday. Um, Zaheen is a consultant for startups and social enterprises for the United Nations Development Program. She works with entrepreneurs to identify growth opportunities while developing the ecosystem for entrepreneurship in developing countries. She will be giving a workshop on the work she has done that will hopefully allow you to similarly inspire local innovation through your project and actions. This half hour workshop is 2.30 um, next Saturday. And in addition to these workshops, we are doing a couple of fun activities. So the first one will begin tomorrow from 8 to 9 p.m. just to kind of close off the first weekend of events. And this will be a discussion based game. Uh, we'll be playing Roses and Thorns. So this will be a nice way to meet other participants in the event and kind of hear um, how things are going for everyone else. Um, the following Saturday to open up the event at 9.30 a.m. Join us over breakfast for some icebreaker games. Again, um, people who have you know all of the participants who have registered you guys all came from a very diverse array of backgrounds and fields and education levels so this is a really great way to kind of network and meet some other people who are interested in um, this hackathon and more kind of into the nitty-gritty uh regarding our platforms um uh don't be mean um, we have no tolerance for any kind of behavior um, like those mentioned here. And again, we can remove you from the event even easier now with just a few simple clicks. So we're not really doing a second chance policy here. Um, the password for all Zoom meetings is Palladium. It's my favorite transition medal. Um, won a few Nobel Prizes. So um, it's uh, hopefully not too difficult to remember. It will be the same password for all meetings, but every meeting has a unique meeting meeting link. Again, all these links are available on the Google Drive and they will be made available on the Discord as well. Um, one other note, uh, please change your Discord nickname to something at least close to your real name so we can identify you and know who you are. Um, obviously, our Discord is a closed channel, so everybody who's not part of the event will be removed. And I've mentioned this a few times already, but a lot of important documents will be uploaded into the Google Drive folder. So the schedule, the document with all meeting links, your teammate contact info, um, the sample experiment manual for your teacher's activity manual, um, the curriculum for the high school STEM programs in the Philippines, um, the reimbursement form, and again, the guidelines for participants where all the information you'll need uh, will be. Make sure again to read that. And um, I've mentioned this a few times, um, but make sure to create a um, profile on DevPost. And right away, you and your team can make a project page. Um, it's pretty easy to do this. DevPost, I think, is relatively intuitive to use. You just have to click um, enter a submission and then begin creating your project page, which you can upload as, which you can update as you go. Again, um, 
You can post updates through your project page, so just kind of blog post type um, update, and please post some pictures. We kind of lose that element, um, you know, in the online event, but we would really like um, some cool photos. So snap a few selfies, especially um, because the most active team will be getting a prize. So I highly recommend doing this, especially if you like gift cards. Um, lastly, I want to introduce our mentor program. So we have a very strong team of mentors this year. They are all professionals working in STEM fields and mentors can help you with a variety um, of issues. So maybe with certain software, maybe with developing, um, just building, building together your final product. Mentors, again, will be able to help you with a lot of things. Um, we recommend meeting with mentors at least twice um, just to uh, ask them for any help that you might need and mentor mentor hacker interactions will be facilitated through the discord and I will be showing you now how that works. Um, oh, one other note, um, our hackathon hours as you saw in the schedule are officially nine to nine um, in the four weekend days but um, if you want to work throughout the week you can do that. Uh, just note that staff and mentor availability will be limited so make sure to ask mentors any questions that you will have um, ASAP um, during this weekend and next Saturday. Also, one more thing, um, if you kind of want help with just um, ideation and you kind of want someone to give you the green light um, regarding the direction that your team seems to be heading, you can tag at Super Mentor, and this will link you to one of our Pueblo Science team members who will be able to kind of guide you in the right direction if you wanted some guidance before your first project proposal pitches. Again, those start tonight at six. And um, again, please add yourself to the Discord if you haven't already. I think most people have. Um, there uh, is some, a lot of instructions there on how to do it, but I will do a live demo now. Um, so like I said, I recommend uh, downloading the Discord app, but you can also um, use the, I'm just showing the browser version here because it's a little bit easier to screen share. Um, but when you open it up, these are where announcements will be posted. One really cool feature we have is you can uh, react to any message with this red pushpin emoji, and this will send a copy of that message to your DMs. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, otherwise, announcements are here. We have some links that are posted here. Uh, meeting links will be posted here every morning and um, obviously read over the server rules. If you want, you can assign a couple of interests. Um, so maybe biology, maybe biomedical engineering, um, maybe entrepreneurship. Um, this is just so you can kind of see um, if you have mutual interests with any hackers or mentors. Um, this is where general questions will be asked and we will be responding to them here as well. These, there are also some chat channels where you can meet other um, hackers. And then uh, we also have a few workshop channels where you can um, discuss any workshops that are happening. Um, some of our speakers will also be joining our Discord, so you might be able to ask them additional questions here as well. So um, this is where uh, you will be reaching out to mentors to schedule help sessions. Um, so there are detailed instructions here that um, Andreas, who set up our Discord, wrote. So that's really helpful. And um, to find a mentor, you have to type first an exclamation mark and then open ticket. It will not work with double. Um, type the what you need help with. So um, for example, uh, I can type my message here. Team member. Um, the reason why is after you file a ticket, you'll open an extra um, chat channel that wasn't there before. But the only people who can view that chat channel is the filer of the ticket, the teammates that person has tagged, and mentors. So make sure you tag everybody else who's part of your team. So I'm going to take some people. I'll take myself. I'll take Leo. So you should have four teammates to tag here. Um, and then what happens then is a ticket chat channel opens up and um, what can happen here is like I mentioned, um, only um, you and the people you have tagged can see it as you can see in the sidebar here. And then a mentor can kind of reach out and offer to help you. Um, so for example, um, yeah, so Leo will ask um, what I need help with and I can kind of specify. Um, and then what else can happen is a mentor can say, um, a mentor can say, I think I can help with this. Um, let's meet up in mentor chat two. 
And what happens then is this. Chat sessions. So um, someone's already on here, but you shouldn't really be on this unless you're meeting with a mentor. Um, you'll just hop onto this um, chat channel and your mentor will also meet you there. And um, that's where you'll have your help session. It is a voice channel now, but you can share video and you can share your screen. So this is where you'll be talking to your mentor to kind of seek help. Um, each of these chat rooms are restricted. So only six members can be on a time at a time. So that's just to make sure your one mentor plus your team can be on there. So no other participants can kind of hop onto your call. And so I just wanted to stress again, um, the actual facilitation of mentor help should be given out through the voice channels and not really through this chat. Um, this chat really is just a directory for mentors to ask you more about what kind of help you need. Um, that way the correct mentor with the right background experience can identify you and then arrange to meet in one of the voice channels. Um, once you're done, you should close this chat channel um, just to make sure your Discord doesn't get too crowded. Note that when you close it, uh, you won't get a copy of anything. So um, make sure to save any messages you want. For example, um, say I wanted this message. Uh, if there was a link, you can react to it with the push pin emoji. And again, this will send a copy um, to your chat, um, to your DMs rather. And so once you're done, make sure to type um, complete and that will close the ticket. But it is gone for good. So again, make sure you um, save all the links that you might need. Okay. Um, and if you have any questions, there is a chat called general questions. So make sure to type them there and one of our staff will reach out. And um, general questions would be for staff and admin members um, for uh, questions pertaining to your project um, for which you need a mentor. Uh, those should be filed through tickets. And lastly, just a quick summary of deliverable and deadlines, um, just things that are coming up very soon. If you haven't already, the deadline is coming up, so make sure you fill out that sign-in form and, um, and fill out that participation agreement form. If you don't do it by 10.30 a.m., you will not be receiving a full refund of your deposit, so make sure to get on that soon. And team leads, make sure that all of your team members have um, signed that as well. Um, also, make sure to sign up for a time for your first project proposal pitches. Um, a link to the Doodle form for that sign up is already up in the Discord in the resources tab. Um, your second project proposal pitches, if needed, uh, you will also have to sign up through that uh, through a similar Doodle, and we will be sending you that as well. And again, uh, your final project should be composed of a uh, activities manual, a depth post video, and your final project um, presentation on Sunday, the final Sunday of the event. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I'm going to turn things over now to um, James, who will be talking about some examples of past um, Pueblo science experiment kits. Uh, hello, everyone. Okay, so I'll start. So my name is James Lee, and I'm um, a Pueblo Science. I've been a Pueblo Science volunteer since uh, 20, 2012. And so today I'm going to um, talk to you about um, a, a few uh, Pueblo Science kits. And so actually, uh, I've been involved in the RISE program that's held in the Philippines, and also my role has been to help assemble. Uh, the training manuals uh, that are that contain each the, that contain the kits uh, that we use when we go over to do the training sessions. Um, so, really, the the purpose of uh, the um, the the um, uh, of this talk today would be to give you inspiration uh, for your own experiment or kit that you're creating during the hackathon. Uh, and as well uh, to go over the concepts covered um, and how the kits that you, we created uh, uh, convey these concepts and to give you an idea about the different types of low cost materials uh, that we use um, uh, as well um, and how as well how we use each of the kits within the context of a RISE program workshop 
and, and even more importantly, how it was used beyond the RISE program workshop. Uh, so the first one that we'll start with is uh, the robotic brush. And so the robotic brush, uh, as you can see from the image, is, you know, it kind of looks like a race car powered by a battery and a motor. Um, but, it, but instead of wheels, it's just, uh, you know, sitting on brush bristles. And uh, in terms of materials, uh, you can see just from the, from the um, pictures here, uh, the, you know, how common the materials are, DC motor, batteries and battery holder, a brush, an eraser, an optional on off switch, uh, and of course, you know, scissor, glue gun, uh, and tape. And so this clip here, it kind of just shows you, uh, shows you the, um, uh, the robo brush in action. And uh, I guess it's, it's the eraser that's kind of vibrating because it's attached to the motor that is allowing uh, the, the car to move, the robo brush to move. And uh, in terms of what the concepts are taught, of course, uh, you know, we can talk about electricity. Um, we can talk about you know, DC motors and even how a DC motor operates. So that gets into electromagnetism, uh, even Ampere's law and torque. Uh, and in terms of, um, sorry, in terms of the uh, uh, curriculum, what I've presented on the right side is um, actually uh, from the Caribbean curriculum. So when we go to Jamaica and Guyana, uh, we, we'd like to help the teacher out by telling them exactly what part in their curriculum uh, our uh, experiments or kits apply. So in this particular case, it's the, you know, it's the electricity and magnetism modules. Um, also, I'd like to just maybe all, all in this talk, I also want to spend a bit of time talking about how it's implemented in the RISE program. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, the, the activity where we go over to, uh, let's say, places like Philippines and uh, in Ghana and Jamaica and uh, teach the teachers um, uh, the, the kits that we've developed. And as mentioned earlier, so we tried to teach in 90 minute sessions and usually we hold five or six sessions uh, throughout, uh, you know, two or three days uh, to do this. And for something like the robo brush, uh, you know, it's, it looks like it's fairly easy to assemble. And so uh, we may not need, you uh, know, so it might, you know, 90 minutes might be a long time for, the, for, the, for that session. So we'd like to, we tend to combine smaller kits uh, and multiple smaller kits into one. Uh, so into one session. So for example, you can have an electricity theme by combining the robo brush with something like a pinwheel and motor lighting up an LED. Or we have, you can have a robotics theme by building different robots um, and to go with the robotic brush. And, you know, just for something fun at the end of the, at the end of the, uh, the, the, the workshop, uh, we like to take something from each of the sessions that we uh, that they just attended and try to integrate them into a science relay race. Uh, so, for example, something like the robo brush would be, uh, you know, the obvious thing you can do with it is, you know, try to race it along a track. And so this is in uh, in the rice program in the Philippines uh, where they're racing their uh, robo brushes. And, and this is uh, kind of the a clip that shows it up, uh, uh, up close. And you can see it's actually the, the robo brush is made from a toothbrush head, right? That, that is separated from the handle. And so, yeah, this is, you know, emphasizing what we mean about uh, being able to use low cost materials. Um, the next few slides just kind of takes you into how the sessions work, the RISE, sorry, the RISE program uh, works. And so, of course, we have uh, volunteer instructors that come over from Canada, let's say, and um, uh, to teach. And this one is in Rise in, in Jamaica. And so uh, we go over the concepts in the beginning um, of the class or of the session. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, not, not all the, you know, we sometimes we can't bring uh, that many people over. So we do work with local instructors. So, for example, Rise in Philippines um, helps us. Uh, help us out uh, sort of on the ground. And most of the session after the concepts are taught uh, is, um, you know, the teachers just go and try to build the demo, the demo, uh, the, the kits that you've uh, 
uh, created. Uh, and then the instructors would then go around and give assistance, right? And so this kind of all happens uh, within a 90 minute sessions. And so this, the, the previous slide was in Philippines. This is in Jamaica with a local instructor who actually works for IBM, uh, the local IBM. Um, I mentioned, so, uh, so yeah, that just gives you a bit of context. So uh, the, another kit that, I, uh, that I've mentioned earlier was the pinwheel generator. So lighting up an LED uh, using a pinwheel and a motor. Um, and, you know, so this is something we can tack on with the robo brush. And so uh, in addition to the same concepts taught in that first kit, we can also now begin talking about wind power and clean energy, right? Uh, again, listed on the right side is the, um, the curriculum relevance specifically for, uh, for the Caribbean curriculum. Um, same thing, giving you an idea about the uh, materials. We have a, you know, a cheap LED, uh, push pins, and, uh, and the acetate sheet or transparencies, or even cardstock can be used to make the, the pinwheel portion of the experiment. And so, you know, this is at the end, the teachers have constructed it and they're just testing it out by lighting up the LED by sticking their device in front of a, of, of a fan. So, uh, so, you know, something like this, it is, while it is simple, you can either consider, if you're thinking of along these lines, you can either consider building up complexity uh, it, or, or even combining multiple um, uh, uh, small, smaller units into a full teaching uh, session, right? Uh, another thing we can, we've done is to teach water purification by having the teachers uh, in, the pro, in, the, in the workshop uh, build uh, water filters. And so, um, you know, you can talk about the aquatic ecosystem. So this is more into their environmental science team. So you can talk about the aquatic ecosystem, the importance of clean water. And uh, for specific example, let's say the charcoal filter, then you can begin really talking about organic molecules, uh, organic contaminants, uh, uh, such as pesticides um, as well, right? Um, so materials wise, water bottle or paper cup, uh, a coffee filter or like something like a cheesecloth and food coloring. Um, and so for a physical filter, we can, you know, we can use a uh, uh, gravel and sand combination. And for, for a charcoal filter, we ask them to get charcoal. But the other thing as well is, you know, if, they, if it's charcoal is not easy to purchase, we then give instructions where they can, let's say, uh, burn uh, uh, rice husk or coconut shells uh, in order for them to create the, the charcoal. And so this is the finished product. On the left picture, you can see uh, uh, this teacher has created uh, using you know, different sizes of rocks and, and sand. And so she can filter muddy water with that as the, as the experiment. And on the right side with the charcoal filter, then we have uh, a water that's been colored with food dye. And so you, know, you can teach about uh, uh, adsorption uh, uh, of the of the dye molecule by the charcoal, um, right? Uh, so you know those are two kind of quick uh, examples. So the next two or the last two ex the the last two experiments that I wanted to cover are actually two of our most popular ones. So I wanted to present them even just for that purpose. Uh, but the other thing is actually the next two example kits uh, really kind of uh, hammer home. The, what we really aim to do, which is you know, to inspire local innovation and to you know, build uh, something for the community. So something beyond just the, the teaching sessions. And so the first one here is the uh, um, learning about fluid power by building a robotic arm. And as you can see from the image, uh, it's, it, it's basically a crane uh, where you know, the scoop can, uh, can kind of open and close. Uh, the arm can raise and lower, and then there's also a base that it can rotate. Uh, and so, and all of these are being actuated by uh, this syringe, uh, water in a syringe and uh, uh, tubing, right? Um, and so here, yeah, so the, in terms of the curriculum, this is really like a full mechanics, all right? So, uh, you know, Force, whether it's about forces or, sta or dynamics or statics. Uh, so you can talk about pressure, 
um, uh, hydraulics, uh, even uh, you know the different types of motions and the different types of machines, right? And uh, material-wise, it's actually very simple. I, I just mentioned uh, we, ha we have uh, syringe and tubing, uh, as well as an and cardboard, and that's really, and, and tape, I guess, and that's really all they need. But what's important here is they're basically building a model crane. And so in terms of the, the, the instruction manual, what we had to provide them was essentially template, cut out templates that they can uh, you know, take from their manual or print out uh, tape onto the cardboard and, and uh, trace it out, right, or cut it out. And so if this is something that you're thinking of building, then yes, uh, you'd have to provide, you know, uh, accurate size templates, let's say that fit on uh, US letter or A4 paper, um, uh, th those kind of considerations. And so these are actually uh, high school students from Guyana. And, and so they're, uh, uh, they've built uh, the the crane or the robo arm uh, for themselves. Uh, so within the, the RISE program, um, again, it's taught in a 90 minute session, but as you can tell from all of that uh, templates, that is really a lot of steps. And so it's usually a standalone activity. So this can easily fill in the whole 90 minute session. Uh, but, but that's okay because the, uh, you know, with all the concepts that you can cover as well, and you know, this would be a great, uh, this is okay, both in terms of the complexity of the assembly, but also in the complexity or uh, the concepts of the concepts um, to stand by itself. And again, uh, the um, uh, Pueblo instructors would just go around and helping the students, um, uh, helping, sorry, the teachers, the attendees uh, with the experiment, uh, with the assembly. Um, and so these are just more images from our uh, RISE program workshops. Uh, and so this is kind of the finished, uh, finished products. Now, in terms of uh, integration uh, into the science relay that I mentioned earlier, so the, the nice thing about this one, you know, it's so what you can do is you can uh, kind of try to pick up uh, marshmallows from a race to pick up marshmallows uh, uh, and place them into a cup. Um, and so the images here just so show the science relay, relay race in, in action. And uh, you can see this is kind of in an outdoor, uh, in an outdoor gym slash auditorium, as you can see from the stacked chairs there. So it's, uh, it's an, sorry, not outdoor, open air, open air gym slash auditorium. And the, um, the, the clusters there are, are, are each station of the, the science race, the relay race. Um, so, uh, this is, you know, look, so, so these are actually teachers, but you can see from, from the pictures that, you know, there's, there's excitement in their faces and, you know, they're having a lot of fun, uh, trying to, you know, win the, after, after a couple of days of doing the workshops, you know, this is a nice, uh, competition at the end of it for, for them to do. And so this is again, uh, in Guyana, but, uh, doing the same, um, uh, robo arm, uh, station of the relay race. And the last experiment I wanted to cover is the ice cream making. Uh, and, you know, this one uh, is nice, of course, because uh, they also get to eat the, ex the, the ice cream that they made. Uh, and so this is always fun for the teachers. Um, so, oh yeah, and in terms of the curriculum, uh, you know, this, you can go from just basic chemistry, talking about mixtures, phase changes, colligative properties, uh, and you can also even go into food chemistry. Uh, so talking about, you know, the role of stabilizers, tastes and textures. And so there's kind of a, you know, again, this is a very complete uh, kit because there's a lot of uh, concepts to cover. Um, and you can even uh, begin doing scientific investigation where you can ask questions like, how can you make the ice cream more smooth? You know, how can you, uh, decrease the um, size of the uh, ice crystals that form, things like that, right? Uh, in terms of materials, of course, we have ice, a salt, a plastic bag, a can, a canister, a uh, newspaper, and even the food ingredients. So just wanted to note here, even the food ingredients. So they end up using, you know, cream 
uh, condensed and evaporated milk, but these are all in gelatin. And these are all can, um, sorry, canned or shelf stable, right? So just keep in mind that when we're doing the, the, uh, the sessions, the, uh, the workshops, that if you're trying to teach 100 teachers, they really won't have you know, fridges for a uh, fridge space or even a fridge to host, uh, to hold ingredients for 100 teachers. So th things like that, uh, um, uh, you should consider in terms of the materials. And so, so they put all of, you know, they put the food ingredients into the bag and the bag into the canister uh, with ice and salt, uh, packed in ice and salt uh, and wrap it with newspaper. And so that takes care of the, uh, takes care of the freezing part. Um, but now in terms of, uh, you know, doing the churning, uh, so because we don't have, uh, again, we don't have access to blenders and mixers. And so what they basically do is they, they uh, kind of toss the, the, uh, the canister that they just created a, a about uh, to do the churning, right? That's the ice cream churn part. And so these are clips from both Philippines and Guyana. And, you know, they're kind of having fun doing everything outdoors, either rolling on, or tossing the ice cream around. Um, and then as well, eating it at the end, right? Which is always, which is always nice. And last thing I wanted to mention, um, so we want, you know, outside of the session, we want uh, the, the RISE program. We also want to ensure that they, you know, uh, what impact we're creating beyond just the RISE workshop. And so one anecdote I'd like to give is a teacher, a science teacher named Christina um, from, uh, from Davao in Philippines, uh, took our um, um, workshop in 2012. So this is her with the pointed with the red arrow and on, on the left side. And on the right side, you can see that uh, she, uh, pictures of her in her own classroom implementing uh, the program, uh, our um, demonstrations itself, right? And so that's always nice to see. But one step beyond that is, uh, you know, what the students that they've taught actually do with the, um, with the, the, the Pueblo science kits. And so one of one nice success story that we've seen is a lot of them, you know, use what they learn and enter them into science fair. So for example, the fluid power or the robo arm, uh, we've heard of one student, actually one of Christina's students created, a, you know, something that can pick up a rice with it. So like a rice scooper uh, for, their, for their project. And uh, these images here are from like almost like a hydraulic science fair event. And you can see from this image of the hydrozer, which is I suppose a hydraulic bulldozer, there are now, instead of having three uh, degrees of movement, this person has, the students have like 12 syringes there. So there's probably, I don't know how many moving parts there are uh, in these, uh, in, in what they've created. So, you know, they've built upon what we've given them and, and improved upon it and use it in science fairs. And more, uh, another success story that we like is some uh, one, same student of Christina, or um, um, same teacher, I mean, Christina, one of her students ended up um, using the ice cream kit and, and started making and selling ice cream uh, in, in their neighborhood or to their neighbors. And so this be even, even becomes a form of uh, livelihood uh, for the students. And so, you know, these examples here, you really just show how we can inspire local innovation and also for, for the students themselves to even be able to build something extra for their community. And so I, I mean, I'll end here by kind of re, uh, reposting the takeaway message that I've, I've I put in at the beginning, but really the next step here is, you know, it's your turn and, you know, we're all excited to see um, the kind of kits and experiments that you guys will create during this hackathon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, James. Um, so I'm gonna close things off now. And so hacking has officially begun. It looks like everybody has signed the participation agreement form, which is great. Make sure you all also sign in through the sign in form. I have just reposted this on the Discord. You need to complete this form also by 10.30. So you have one more minute to do this. Um, if you are a few minutes late, we might be lenient, but please do this ASP. I think there's only a handful of people who have yet to do this. Um, besides that, look out for our first workshop with Jordan on ideation and that will begin at 11.